SJC 12967 in the matter of an impounded case. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Black. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please the court, ADA Johanna Black for the Commonwealth. In amending section 52 of General Laws Chapter 119 by its 2018 Criminal Justice Reform Act, the legislature believed that the earlier a child enters the juvenile justice system, the higher the risk it is for that child to recidivate. Now, the exclusion that was created in the amendment, um, which excludes uh, civil infractions, violations of municipal ordinances, violations of town bylaws, and a first offense of a six months or less misdemeanor, prevented, or at least in some children's cases, delayed their entry into the juvenile justice system. Now, language, the language of section 52, as well as the intent behind the amendment to that section, supports the Commonwealth's position that six months or less, uh, a first offense of a six months or less misdemeanor that's charged with at least one greater offense <clears throat> should not be dismissed as a first offense when it's charged, when all those charges are on the same complaint. Um, and because Wallace W. Um, created the Wallace W. hearing to establish a first offense, such hearings would not be applicable uh, to the juveniles' cases. I'm confused. Now, so if, if, you, if you charge two misdemeanors, <clears throat> uh, then you get to arraign on both of them? Two, yes. you, charge, you charge two mis, lesser offense, you know, misdemeanors of six months or less. So if that's the case, you get to charge and arraign on both of those just because yes. you've done, that makes no sense, does it? Is that really consistent with what they wanted to have happen here? I believe that when you're interpreting a statute, you first look to the plain language of the statute. And this court interpreted that language, a first offense of a six months of or less misdemeanor to mean um, a single six months or less misdemeanor. Um, the words that are used in a singular form. Um, but, you, but you do have to, you have to, you, until you have one, you have none. And probable cause doesn't get you anywhere under the statute as we explained in Wallace W. So if you do two misdemeanors, both of them can go, end up going away. Um, the first one could be just dismissed as, you know, a bad charge. And the second one, you still have to establish. So I don't understand why just pleading two charges gets you anywhere. Well, the statute um, doesn't say anything about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And it also, as you said, doesn't specify probable cause. However, as this court interpreted it, it does apply to one and only one six months or less misdemeanor if that offense happens to be the child's first offense. And as you said, if you're charged with two and one um, is not a good charge, meaning the police or the prosecution were um, incorrect and inadvertently charged something that was not supported by sufficient probable cause, a Humberto H motion to dismiss would kick that charge out and then you would be left with only one um, six months or less misdemeanor. It doesn't, it, what you charge isn't going to be the determinative factor. You've got to establish a first offense that, I mean, just your charging can't determine things. Uh, it's got to be what's proven and we required an adjudication. Um, so I'm just, I don't, see your argument. I understand if there's a felony or a more serious offense, the Commonwealth can proceed directly on that. That's separate. That's completely outside the first offense protection. But I don't get that the Commonwealth gets to dictate um, by its charging mechanism. It can make the first offense requirement go away. It just doesn't seem to, I don't see any basis in the statute and as the author of Wallace W, that certainly wasn't what we were writing. Well, the legislature in not qualifying the other exclusions did qualify a first offense of a six month or less misdemeanor. So that alone, um, in addition to um, its legislative history um, supports the Commonwealth's position that two 
six months or less misdemeanors that are supported by probable cause um, would not constitute a first offense of a six month or less misdemeanor. The Commonwealth um, disagrees respectfully with your honor's interpretation of the word offense in Wallace W. Um, the word offense should be taken to mean probable cause. And if you look at that section 52. Wanna, hold it. I just wanna make sure, because are you saying we're wrong in Wallace W that probable cause, we shouldn't, I mean, we understand you argued vigorously for probable cause the first time around, but you know, we don't do do overs on issues we've already decided. So are you asking us are you to declare our original decision wrong on probable cause? I don't think you have to, to rule um, that the six month or less misdemeanor should not be dismissed in this case. However, um, the interpretation of offense in Wallace W is incorrect. And Juvenile 2 did raise this issue in um, his responsive brief that in certain circumstances, in some cases, if two children recidivate, one who committed a first offense of a felony, uh, that charge pending when he or she commits uh, his or her second offense being a, a six month or less misdemeanor, uh, might be treated less harshly than a child who in it, his or her first interaction with the juvenile justice system commits a six months or less misdemeanor as well as a felony charge. In the first circumstance, well, let me put it this way, when you um, view both children at their first interaction with the juvenile justice system, the latter child, the one that's charged with more than just a six month or less misdemeanor charge or offense, um, has committed more serious misconduct because his or her misconduct gave rise to more serious charges. The, um, I, I don't think you can assume the children will recidivate. So I think, um, I think the Commonwealth's interpretation of section 52 not requiring dismissal of six months or less misdemeanor charges when they're charged in one complaint with greater offenses makes sense. But if both children do recidivate, then you have the first child who is facing a pending felony charge, but won't be arraigned on the six months or less misdemeanor charge unless the Commonwealth proves the felony charge beyond a reasonable doubt under Wallace. Whereas you have a child who's charged with a felony as well as a six month uh, or less misdemeanor charge in the first instance arraigned on both. If you um, follow the Commonwealth's interpretation of offense, that helps level the playing field in that um, maybe less common possible uh, situation that could arise under Wallace W. So you I don't think we, sorry. Uh, why don't you, one, I, you know, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle to reverse what we did the first time. This is hard enough without going backwards. Why don't you address defense counsel's argument that we shouldn't, in, in a single episode, um, that we shouldn't treat a single episode as a first offense. Um, why don't you address that point? Sure. Um, so the way section 52 reads is, a child uh, between the ages of 12 and 18 who commits any offense against a law of the Commonwealth. A law of the Commonwealth is singular. And any offense can be a felony, a major misdemeanor, or six month or less misdemeanor. You then so, exclude, sorry, you then exclude. So let, me, let me pose, let me make it narrower for you. So you've got, okay, we've got a single act. We often, in, obviously in criminal law, have, you know, if you have different elements, we can find two different crimes for them. But uh, so, we have this juvenile, he engages in a single act and you come up with a couple of different misdemeanors um, based on that. Uh, again, it's, it's a five minute episode in this juvenile's life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still, we shouldn't treat that as a first offense. We should separate it into as many offenses as you legally can. Is that, and that's what the legislature intended. I'm just, and it's not a rhetorical question because I think this is really difficult. 
No, I, I understand. I think these are very complicated issues too. And I think in an effort to keep application of the law um, consistent across different people, if conduct supports a charge, you charge unless in your discretion there are justifications for not doing so. So I know one of the juveniles raised the argument of double jeopardy and that you wouldn't be convicted or sentenced on, for example- I'm not, I'm not focused on double jeopardy. I'm focused on the legislative intent here. Um, right. And the idea is they wanna give juveniles a second chance. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering whether charging decisions are going to prevent a second chance for a single episode is that what the legislature intended? And I don't know what they intended because it's not that clear, but it would help if you can address that kind of specific. Sure. So I think if you, under that interpretation, if you are going to, dis, you are going to um, focus on the episode to determine whether a child ha gets a second chance or not, then you are running up against a problem where although the legislature specified a six month or less misdemeanor and did not say a major misdemeanor, there are charges that I think argument that uh, constitute major misdemeanors that I think arguments could be made that the conduct supporting them is not that much more egregious or serious than a six month or conduct supporting a six month or less mis uh, misdemeanor. That's, so, the easy, that's the easy stuff because the legislature did not allow this type of second chance on more serious offenses. It's the lesser offenses where they are occurring in a single episode that's difficult. You get to, no one's getting in your way, the legislature or Wallace W on proceeding on more serious offenses. It's these lesser offenses that occur in single episodes, which are the more difficult question. You well, make your scenario it harder on yourself by trying to you know, glom the two different things together, but go ahead. Well, I think, so a scenario comes to mind. The problem with the single episode is, and this is just coming to mind right now, so feel free to pick at it if I'm not um, giving the best example, but someone charged with threat to commit a crime, that's a six month or less misdemeanor charge. Threat to commit a crime could be a charge that is part of a larger context of very serious scary misconduct. However, someone could be charged with a larceny for something that is more like a shoplifting. And a larceny, I believe, would be a, a major misdemeanor. But ju Justice Lowey asked, a, a student pointed out that, yes, you may need to prove the lesser one is part of the bigger one, but I'm not sure anything we're doing is precluding evidence that's related to the lesser one from going into the greater one. No, I'm sorry. You were asked, I was answering your question about why don't we focus on a single episode versus a single charge in determining what mm -hmm. constitutes a first offense of a six month or less misdemeanor. I think if we do that, then we run the risk of treating juveniles differently in that some six month or less misdemeanor charges, the conduct supporting them could actually be more serious than some of the conduct that could support some major misdemeanors. And so by looking at a single episode, it doesn't seem it, run into, it runs into problems as well. And I think where section 52 already said, um, it, they had this general definition of delinquent child, meaning a child who commits any offense against a law, a singular law of the Commonwealth, that existed when the legislature amended it. And they amended it by carving out that category. And they, one of the uh, exclusions from that category were a, was a six month or less uh, a first offense of a six month or less misdemeanor charge. So that's carving out from the category of any offense against a law of the Commonwealth. A law of the Commonwealth is one crime. It's one charge. It's not one episode that could lead to multiple offenses against multiple laws of the Commonwealth. So I think that um, reading of the language as well as stat principles of statutory construction show that it really should be a violation of the law, not an episode where a child violates multiple laws, even if it's just two laws. 
And I think it goes back, um, what we were getting into a little bit was, um, well, I'll just, I'll, I won't get into that, but um, I do think section 52 is, again, doesn't state probable cause and doesn't state proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It defines delinquent child. And that term is carried throughout the statutory scheme of chapter 119, section 52, and the subsequent sections. And in that, you read that a child can be complained of as a delinquent child, meaning they can be charged or alleged to have committed a, an offense against a law of the Commonwealth, or they can be adjudicated delinquent, uh, meaning they could be found uh, to have committed it, found beyond a reasonable doubt to have committed it, or they could plea out and admit to having committed an offense against the law of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Ms. Black. Your time's up. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll turn now to Ms. Jellison, please. Good morning, Justices, and may it please the court. Eva Jellison on behalf of Juvenile 2. I'm going to be addressing the multi-count complaint issue. Uh, Attorney Chelly will follow me and address evidentiary issues at a Wallace W. hearing. And Attorney Menken will go last and address the issue regarding the promotion of anarchy statute. Um, Wallace W. didn't resolve this issue, but it did help us a little bit. It told us that probable cause was not enough. Simply charging a juvenile with multiple offenses does not give the juvenile court jurisdiction over any offense. It also counseled us that first offense of a misdemeanor is ambiguous. And because it's ambiguous, we need to interpret it in light of the legislature's intent, the rule of lenity, and General Law Chapter 119, Section 53. Um, and I'd just like to respond quickly to a point that the Commonwealth made that the statute says a law of the Commonwealth. I'd like to point out that in this case, my client was charged with two offenses or two crimes that arose from one law of the Commonwealth, disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace are both in one statute. So I don't think that that language helps. I think it, it, it highlights the ambiguity of the statute. So what we should do here is interpret first offense of a misdemeanor to be any minor misdemeanors, not based on the Commonwealth's charging decisions, and dismiss those misdemeanors without a Wallace W. hearing. And we don't need a Wallace W. hearing because there is no prior offense to prove. The court was pretty clear in Wallace W. that Wallace W. hearings were about proving prior offenses. There is no prior offense to prove the minor misdemeanors should be dismissed as the child's first uh, offense. To make sure I understand, your your client is charged, I got so many juveniles here, your, your client is charged Absolutely. with two, two lesser my, misdemeanors, two under six month, six month or under misdemeanors, is that right? My client was charged with three, uh, six months, three minor misdemeanors, one more serious misdemeanor, and the felony which the Commonwealth concedes must be dismissed. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm confused then. Your client, they could proceed directly on the more serious misdemeanor, right? That's There's correct. No, and then we've got three minor misdemeanors left, right? That's right. So for you to have those all dismissed, we have to adopt the MACO interpretation or one of your interpretations that says, um, a first offense includes all of the first offenses charged in a single episode, right? That's the only way you get dismissed, because if we don't, they could prove one of them. If we don't adopt that interpretation, there are potentially three first, three offenses here, and two of those could be arraigned and adjudicated, unless we adopt a single episode approach, right? Yes, if you don't adopt the approach that first offense of a misdemeanor means any misdemeanor charged as a first episode of conduct within a first episode of conduct, then yes, you could come up with different results. You could say that you have to prove the greater offense at a Wallace W hearing and misdemeanors could okay, go forward. So you could say a, so a number okay. of things, but I don't think that's the right interpretation if you look at the ambiguity in the statute and you interpret it in light of the rule of lenity in section 53. And okay, I think so I'd like to go straight. Can, yes, Justice you, Cocker. Yeah, I just wanna make sure, cause I need help here. So we're careful about not treating, you can be convicted of multiple crimes as long as they have different elements. So I'm just trying to make sure 
how do we adopt your interpretation without running into a lot of our other law out there um, on, you know, that treats separate, you know, where there are different elements, we've got different offenses and different crimes. Just help us out here. Is it because of the legislative history? What is it, what is it that does that? Yeah, so I believe it comes from the legislative intent to begin with. So where first offense of a misdemeanor is ambiguous, the legislature's intent was to benefit children by, and specifically the court said this in Wallace W, it said it in Laszlo L, this is about giving children a second chance. This is about targeting repeat criminal conduct. This is about minimizing conduct, contact with the juvenile legal system. So that's the question. The laws, no, is that, is that sorry, that's Justice Lynn? Yeah, so I would like you to focus on uh, Justice Kapoor. I think he's trying to do this too. I don't understand what it is that the legislature was trying to do. When you say second chances, second chances at what? Second chances at not having any involvement with the juvenile justice system? Because if that's the case, how do we deal with the other, uh, the major offense? So I have to say, I don't know precisely what they meant by second offense. I think it's pretty clear that if you have only minor misdemeanors, those should be dismissed. You should really get a second chance at entering the juvenile yeah, you know, legal system entirely. Right. But, but where you have, have sorry, you Justice, like, I, didn't, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, you're in the justice system anyway, right? Because the, yes. the court clearly has jurisdiction over the major misdemeanor or whatever you want to call it, the major, yes, the major misdemeanor. The other yeah, one. So, absolutely. So, has, it has, so you, you're, done, you don't, you're not doing that doesn't fulfill any legislative function, does it? I believe that it does. I believe that where the legislature wanted to give children a second chance, and they didn't define that second chance particularly, that you can look at the benefit to the juvenile of having these minor misdemeanors dismissed. And I addressed this in my brief. And I think that there are a couple ways that this still provides a child with a second chance and it still satisfies the legislative intent. And one is that children are particularly sensitive to fairness when they're treated fairly by the juvenile legal system. They're more likely to be legally socialized. They're more less likely to recidivate. Recidivism was, an was a focus of this legislation. A second part is that multiple ent entries on a carry are harmful to children. It doesn't matter how those entries actually end up. And this court recognized that in Preston P. I have a number of case citations in my brief about how police make charging decisions based upon the number of carry entries. Judges make decisions on the number of carry entries. Probation officers make decisions on the number of carry entries as to their recommendations. So this would provide the child with a version of a second chance. And I think that where the conduct, where the legislature sought to not even give our system really the chance over, the, this was a jurisdictional modification and they sought to substantially contract the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. Ms. Jellison, I can I give you yes, a, a, an example that might uh, make your point and see if I understand it? Because uh, yes. your, your overall point is, if you have you know, one interaction that brings you in touch with the criminal justice system, and say you're a, uh, you're 15 years old, you're, you're driving a car without um, a license, the, your friends uh, have some uh, alcohol in the car and when you get pulled over, you know, your uh, behavior is enough to lead to a disturbing the peace and or disorderly conduct. And so it all happened in, in 10 minutes. It was one touch of the juvenile with the criminal justice system. And the goal of the legislation is to give that juvenile um, an opportunity without getting involved in the criminal justice system uh, to, to rehabilitate and hopefully that'll be it. But if, if, if you could just have only one of those dismissed and the other three are there, the intent of the legislature is lost. That's correct. Can, can I ask you a question, Ms. Jellison? Absolutely. Would would your interpretation promote overcharging? So I, I don't believe that my interpretation specifically promotes overcharging more than overcharging is already a problem. So to the extent that the legislature modified this, and we're here because the Commonwealth has doggedly pursued minor misdemeanors um, that were you know, charged as part of this first episode of misconduct, Honestly, I, I really think it's incumbent upon the Commonwealth not to overcharge children. Um, I think that this prevents the Commonwealth's overcharging from affecting the juvenile 
in a more negative way. So if the Commonwealth overcharges by charging two misdemeanors, charging disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace, both of those are dismissed and the Commonwealth's overcharging does not harm the juvenile. Where they're charged with these lesser misdemeanors and a more significant offense still helps the juvenile in the way that I explained by having fewer carry entries. If the Commonwealth chooses to charge a bunch of felonies because they can't accept that the legislature wanted to help children, we don't really have the tools under this particular statute to stop that, but I would hope that the Commonwealth wouldn't do that. I think that's all I could say to that overcharging question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jellison, another question. In, I'm looking for statutory support for your approach, because you know we're, we're, we're uncomfortable enough here without much legislative guidance. So I, I was looking at sort of the armed career criminal, Justice Bud's decision in Garvey. Mm -hmm. um, or, or do we have a similar type of statutory structure or language in the statute that would support this one episode approach for these minor juveniles? Where do we turn for statutory support for this as opposed to just the, you know, the second chance intent here? I'll have to say, I, I think I would have to write a, a, a 22C letter on the specific habitual offender statute or specific armed career criminal statute if, if your honor would, would prefer. But I can say that I, I believe that this is a term of art that we haven't seen before. Um, if you want to look towards kind of the the intent of those recidivist statutes, I know that habitual offender, the habitual offender law is applied to episodes of misconduct, so this would be a similar approach as that. Um, the armed career criminal statute, I know the armed career criminal statute has different language, I just can't point to exactly what that is in this moment. One, one, of, the, one of the two of them uses the word incidences, and then we, we use the incident, the incidences language to move one incident. It needs to be separate incidents. The yeah, other, I believe that was it, habitual offender. That would track with the habitual offender statute so, decision in Garvey. So I don't see that as being as helpful, but but then the habitual offender also has the word habitual in it, um, which right. also gives some indication about habit. I mean, I, I guess, you know, focusing on that, it, you, it reminds me, this is, this is all a, I think we can see in the statutory language that there is a huge temporal component to this. And I think that that's why the court said that the legislature, I mean, the, the legislature said it, but the court also recognized that the legislative intent was about punishing repeat offenders. Because when it's a first offense, whatever that means, it, you know, the, the child is having their first contact with the juvenile justice system. And that's what happened here. And I think the legislature intended and wrote first offense with this temporal element to focus us on that. Was this the first instance of misconduct that violated a law of the Commonwealth or laws of the Commonwealth? Or was this a repeat offender committing successive offenses where we know that you know, it's not simply avoiding the jurisdiction of the juvenile court that would be helpful, but guidance from the juvenile court. So I think first is a really important word in this statute, um, but I do think it's ambiguous. And I think that this meaning, court- Meaning first is different from single? First is different from single, absolutely. I think it's temporal rather than, than referring to a single incident or a single crime. I guess it is a single incident, but it's not a single crime. Any further questions? Thank you, Ms. Chelsea. Thank you very much. Ms. Chelly, please. Good morning. May it please the court. Melissa Chelly for Juvenile 4. I will be discussing the appropriate evidentiary standards for a Wallace W. hearing. And at the outset, I wanted to address um, Attorney Hahn's argument in the earlier case. Um, I agree with Attorney Hahn that in setting the standard at beyond a reasonable doubt, the Wallace W. Court explicitly stated that the Wallace W. hearing was intended to adjudicate a prior offense. Uh, and, you know, in doing that, they recognize the seriousness of a beyond the reasonable doubt standard. Beyond a reasonable doubt calls for proof to the highest degree of certainty possible in matters relating to human affairs. It just seems to me unlikely that one could meet that burden using hearsay evidence. Um, however, I disagree with, um, with Attorney Hahn in saying that 
the Matthews v. Eldridge um, analysis does not apply. I think that the Matthews v. Eldridge analysis does apply here. And in fact, I think that the, um, in its holding in Wallace W, the, court, the, of course, the underpinnings for all of those, for all of the prior decisions is at their foundation, fundamental uh, procedural due process. And in this the, case- The Commonwealth, I, I understood you listened to the prior argument. So what do you make of the Commonwealth's point that we have in at least one context, which requires beyond a reasonable doubt, allowed hearsay to be used? So uh, as one of the juveniles mentioned in their brief, the, there's a presumption that, evident, that evidence is, uh, that the rules of evidence will apply in all, in all cases. And that presumption needs to be overcome with some amount of specificity. In that, in uh, the situation that the Commonwealth was discussing there, which I believe was uh, uh, commitments under chapter 123, section eight, there is a specific statutory exemption. And that's why, you know, that's a little bit different than this case where there is no specific statutory exemption. Um, and let me let me go to the second concern, um, which is we're going to be for something that has you know different type of concept. It's not like revocation of probation or dangerousness. We're going to be requiring, for example, in one of these cases, the victim to testify twice and go through the trauma of this twice. Um, uh, so that. That's a bit of a concern. Um, so how do we deal with that fact that we're going to be, and we're gonna be taking police officers off the streets um, again, in every case then, if we're not gonna allow hearsay, because either we've got the victim or the police in most of these cases, correct? And often we have child victims. So I'm just trying to get a sense of the value of bringing them in each time. Well, at the outset, I would note that in this, in Wallace W, this court addressed this very issue uh, in one of the footnotes, I believe it was footnote 10, the, um, the court said that there would be, that they were recognizing that this may create a problem whereby the Commonwealth will need to bring in witnesses. They will need to bring in police officers, possibly from other jurisdictions in order to meet this. Now, I think that the reason that this is so important is because of the underlying due process concerns here. The Commonwealth and in some of the questioning earlier, the justices have seemingly focused um, pretty narrowly on, on um, incarceration or detention as being the only liberty interest at stake. But that's a, an, overly narrow, um, an overly narrow focus. In fact, both of the parties here, the juvenile and the Commonwealth have a, have a substantial interest in accurately determining whether the prosecution of the juvenile should proceed. Um, and the purpose of the Wallace W hearing is to determine whether the child actually committed a prior offense. Um, the juvenile clearly has this interest because they don't want to, uh, you know, there's an interest in not having the state unduly intrude into their life. But the Commonwealth also has an interest uh, in keeping the juvenile out of the juvenile justice system. Um, the legis as the legislature has recognized, keeping juveniles out of the system at the, um, where the only um, where the only alleged criminal activity was a minor misdemeanor, that actually promotes juvenile development and promotes the safety of society. So both of the, both of the parties here should be aligned in wanting to keep children out of the system uh, when it's low level offenses that we're talking about. Um, and moreover, the juvenile has clearly an interest in avoiding uh, incarceration. But this court has also recognized significant other liberty interests at stake, in particular when we're talking about a child who has not yet gone to the, uh, to, to the arraignment phase. Um, 
the court in Humberto H, in Preston P, has recognized the difference in pre-arraignment and post-arraignment interests. Uh, pre-arraignment, uh, the juvenile has an interest in having less intrusion onto their life. They have less, uh, less chance of missing school and work to attend court um, and you know, maintaining, uh, limiting their interaction with the juvenile justice system means less of a possibility of having pretrial terms of release, which leads to a lesser possibility of minor violations of pretrial release, which leads to a lesser possibility of harsh punishments, all stemming from this early incident. Um, avoiding creation of a carry also leads to, uh, you know, carry leads to a whole host of other problems. As, my, as um, Attorney Jellison described, it can lead to increased sentencing. It can um, lead to increased charging decisions. It can even impact things like a child's future college prospects or employment prospects or access to housing or military enlistments. These are permanent deprivations. Unlike the pretrial probation revocation or, uh, or a post adjudication revocation or dangerousness hearings, which are just you know, for a limited amount of time. And for a variety of reasons, those, uh, those pre-trial here, those pre-arraignment hearings or, po e or even post-arraignment hearings have significantly well, smaller people, liberty people, interests at stake. Pe well, well, people can serve tremendous sentences on a probation. Someone's on probation for armed robbery and, and, and they, you know, um, they violate probation. They could get a significant jail sentence, correct? That is absolutely true. That is that is absolutely true. However, in a probation revocation, if we're talking about a post adjudication probation revocation, at that point, the individual has already had all of these due process protections when they initially got sentenced. Probation was therefore given as a matter of grace by the court. Here, we're really in a different stead, you know, so you can imagine in a probation whether it's pretrial or post adjudication, they, you know, the the individual starts at I, I, one. No, I, I, you, you, have, you have a great point. I was just talking about the liberty interest, and I was just thinking of people that have been given 15 year jail sentences, um, and, and they kind of have a, a huge liberty interest. Absolutely. Absolutely, they do, but they've also had substantial protections prior to that. Um, I can your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. And I see that I'm out of time. Yeah, well, let me just see if, if there are further questions for Ms. Shelley. All right, no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Thank you, Your Honor. And lastly, we'll have Ms. Menken, who's going to tell us about riots, I think, right? <laughs> Good morning, and may it please the court, Michelle Menken, on behalf of Juvenile One. And the third question and that was posed in this court's amicus solicitation was whether the juvenile court erred in dismissing the felony uh, riot charge on the ground that the statute, Chapter 264, Section 11, lacked vitality. And the clear answer is no, there was no error. Not only did the statute lack vitality, but it's overbroad in violation of the first. Do, 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 do we have to reach it if we find it, the, the uh, facts don't um, support it? Isn't I that think. The I, I think mean, it, might be, it might be ducking it, but isn't that the easiest way to do it? I know the court has a preference not to reach constitutional issues like the overbreadth of the statute. And, and yes, I think technically, and um, I think we say so in the brief, that if you find that there was no probable cause, even assuming the validity of the statute, you don't have to reach it. There was no error and the decision below can be affirmed. However, um, I do urge the court to comment on the unconstitutionality of the statute because it is so plainly unconstitutional. Well, on, just, just before you get to that, on the, on the probable cause determination, the juvenile says to the police officer something like, let's go. So it's a, it's a me and you. I, I know it's a tense situation. And, and, and I think as you point out, how is that inciting a riot? I think that that's right. Your Honor, um, it, there's no, I think the, the statute is clear that, you know, this targets promotion or advocacy of very specifically uh, defined conduct by others. And here we have a juvenile who was pushed uh, physically by a police officer and whose response was, okay, you want to go? And, uh, you know, this is not, um, you know, whether it had the effect of inciting anybody, which is another issue. 
um, it was certainly not, um, it was not in any way counseling anybody else or advocating anybody else to engage in assault except for the police officer to assault himself, which as I've said is pretty much the opposite of what the statute prescribes. Um, and also, you know, to the point about whether this actually had the effect of inciting anybody, um, uh, we don't have any allegation that it did. There, there's no connection drawn, uh, even the barest allegation between juvenile one's conduct and the conduct of anybody else. I, I think I might agree with you on this, but I know you want to reach the constitutional issue. So, so don't, keep I, your... I'll segue, I mean, the incitement. So uh, as far as the statute is written currently, um, if there were an allegation that juvenile one's conduct had had the effect of emboldening somebody else to also take on the police, um, there would be strict liability imposed for that, whether that was this juvenile's intention um, in challenging the police officer or not. And that is quite clearly unconstitutional. I mean, we have uh, Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court case law directly on point because we, this is a statute that regulates um, the content of speech, which is presumed to be invalid. And you know, where- Ms. Mackin, can I ask a question on that? I'm, I'm confused a little bit. And again, I'm not a former prosecutor like a number of my colleagues, but so if, if I'm changing the facts a little bit, if one of these juveniles got up and said, let's attack the police, um, you grab, you grab, you know, the paving stones, um, and uh, let's have an armed assault against the police, right? It, it, is, is that, there's nothing you can charge those juveniles with? Or change the facts, you've got, you know, a bunch of angry people and they say, let's, let's attack the state house. Let's, you know, grab our, let's take the paving stones and, um, and I, you know, and, or, or let's take our AK-47s and go into the state house without masks and and right. rebel against the governor's order, saying that so we need is, to wear is masks. That, you know. Is there no, that's that there's no that's not criminal behavior. If it's not just let's bring our protest signs and speak up, but let's attack. So there. That's, so for, so so there's a few answers to that question. First of all. Yes, there, it is criminal behavior, and there are many statutes that punish um, such things. Um, and I'll point out that, uh, in particular, besides, you know, assaults and, and common uh, criminal statutes that you can think of that would apply to conduct such as that, um, one of the amici uh, uh, drew attention to a statute that gives the government great power to address such riotous behavior, and that's in chapter 269, sections one through eight, which have really been kept current. They're in use, they've been amended um, repeatedly. But I guess my question is, does this statute potentially so, apply to these types of hypotheticals I've just posed um, where? Well, it, so it does, it does potentially apply. The problem is that it also sweeps in a lot of other conduct that the government does not, is not entitled to regulate. So in order for this statute to be workable, you would have to, it would have to require an intent and a likely, an intent to cause and a likelihood to cause imminent lawlessness. So in the, in the factual scenario that you describe, you know, they have, you know, at least the first one, they have the rocks, they have the means, the confrontation is nigh, um, that the government has an interest in and a right to address that kind of behavior. But this particular, and there are statutes on the books with, that the government could presently use to, to quell such riotous behavior. But, but does that suggest we should adopt Justice Gaziano's more cautionary approach and just deal with the facts here and not try to wipe out this whole statute because there may actually be things besides a communist insurrection, you know, that, that it applies to. Well, what I would say to that is, as I'm saying, we have other statutes that work to curb such behavior. And the problem with this statute is that it's unconstitutional. It can be misapplied as it was in this case. 
And at this particular moment, it's quite timely. Um, and you can really readily imagine a situation where this statute was used improperly to curb constitutionally protected peaceful demonstrations. And so that is why I urge the court to take on the constitutional issue. It's not difficult. We have Supreme Court case law directly on point that says, here's the requirements if you want to curb um, you know, uh, anti-governmental behavior. Um, it ha there has to be an intent to and a likelihood of causing imminent harm. So, you know, this statute has to be revisited before it could possibly be used. And I think it's incumbent upon this court at this time to comment on the unconstitutionality and unenforceability of this statute, which has lain dormant for over 60 years without amendment, construction, clarification. We have no reason to believe that this is the continuing will of the legislature to have this statute on the books. So if there are no further questions on, I, I think we're, we've covered the lack of probable cause, the unconstitutionality and the sort of desuetude of the statute. Um, I'll turn briefly to uh, the question of whether a Wallace W. hearing was required in this case. And I'd just like to note that juvenile one's position on this issue is slightly divergent from the other juveniles positions. Um, the other positions have a couple of, of problems that I'd like to draw the court's attention to. Number one, it ignore, they, those, those approaches ignore language of Wallace W that seems to plainly state that in a case where a juvenile is uh, charged with multiple offenses, there needs to be a Wallace W hearing. This is one of those difficult to analyze situations that the court addresses. And then the court follows up saying, in these circumstances, a hearing is required. Now, to be sure, the hearing may look a little bit different from a hearing. Your, of your, your, client, your client has, an, I can't remember, yours is Andy. He has an assault and battery charge, right? He has, he has a- He has a minor, number. he has lesser misdemeanors, more serious misdemeanors. And then there was this felony, which was properly dismissed, but yes. So, uh, so the the big the big problem <laughs> with the other approaches. I just don't understand why they can't arraign him. Wallace W says you can proceed directly on the more significant charge. There's one. I'm not saying that they can do anything with the misdemeanors, but are you arguing they can't proceed on the more serious charge as well? I am, and I'll tell you why. And I know that that's controversial. But and and in your honor pointed, your honors commented earlier that there's nothing that should stop the Commonwealth from just charging a felony and just proceeding on a felony. And if that's the child's first offense, so be it. But here's the problem. Um, first of all, if you if you are the the problem is that with that kind of interpretation, kids end up being worse off than they were before this statute was amended because these lesser offenses are sort of out the window. We now have prosecutorial discretion being exercised in a manner that contemplates Wallace W. So there is nothing stopping the Commonwealth from choosing to charge a, a minor misdemeanor offense as a felony offense to avoid this. Now you may say, well, the prosecution has the right to do so if they determine that a juvenile's uh, a, is a, a particular case ought to be you know brought through the courts why don't they have the discretion to go ahead and do that and the problem is that the, the question arises whether before the amendment that would have been the prosecutor's decision and you'd now end up with kids in court who let's say let's take a case like ours let's say that you just drop the minor misdemeanors and the more serious matters proceed you now can't bargain the case down to something lesser. Also, what happens if you go to trial and um, the jury doesn't, from, from the Commonwealth's perspective, it's a potential disadvantage if the jury finds that this charge is too serious, but doesn't have the option to hook the kid on something lesser, there's a greater likelihood of acquittal. Let's say that it, there's a lesser included offense on the table and the jury decides to convict of a lesser included offense, which is a lesser misdemeanor. Then at the end of the day, you've gone through trial, you've gone through the entire proceedings and you now have a matter that has to be dismissed and tucked away. So in terms of judicial economy, 
it may make sense. When you have a juvenile offender who is before the court with no prior record, no prior interaction with police whatsoever, to take a close look at the nature of the conduct and what, what offenses can actually be supported by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and I just, uh, there was one more thing I wanted to say on that. Um, oh, there may, be, there may be instances, certain allegations, obviously, if there is bodily harm involved, pretty plain that there's no way that that is a lesser misdemeanor. If there's been injury or death, for example, I think that those kinds of offenses could be category, categorically excluded. But where you have something that is just minor in nature, that's being, you know, for example, filming the police at an incident like ours that's before the court and having that charged as inciting a riot, um, I think it would be appropriate and, and it would affect the legislative intent to have some sort of a robust inquiry into the evidence supporting that charge before the entire case could proceed. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Let me see if there are further questions of Ms. Mackey. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Good job.